It's a great honor for me to be here at the Empire Club of Canada today, which is arguably the most famous and historically relevant speakers podium to have ever existed in Canada. It has offered its podium to such international luminaries as Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, Audrey Hepburn, the Dalai Lama, Indira Gandhi, and closer to home, from Pierre Trudeau to Justin Trudeau. Literally generations of our great nation's leaders, alongside with those of the world's top international diplomats, heads of state, and business and thought leaders. It is a real honor and a distinct privilege to be invited to speak to the Empire Club of Canada, which has been welcoming international diplomats, leaders in business and in science and in politics. And when they stand at that podium, they speak not only to the entire country, but they can speak to the entire world. Good afternoon, fellow directors, past presidents, members, and guests. Welcome to the 117th season of the Empire Club of Canada and our first summer preseason in the club's history. My name is Antoinette, and I'm the newly minted president of the Empire Club and your host for today's virtual event, The Power of Black Female Leadership. I now call this meeting to order. We cannot do these events without the generous support of our sponsors. I wanna thank our event sponsor, Deloitte, and also wanna recognize our event partner, BBC and livemeeting.ca for webcasting today's event. Today is my first official event at the Empire Club as president. And I feel absolutely humbled to be present, to be presenting these three amazing women who have been trailblazers in the advancement for black women in Canada. Get very emotional here. I'm Italian. <laughs> As first black female elected officials in all three levels of government, they have worked tirelessly to move the dial forward for women of all ages, backgrounds and, ethnic and ethnicities. Their work contributing to the mission of equality have helped build strong foundations and encourage diversity and change for generations to come. Today, we will shine a light on their journeys, how they fought for equal rights, the necessary changes needed to create a conducive climate for equal rights and the actions that made a difference. With the COVID-19 pandemic and the fight for social justice at the far front of our minds, our esteemed guests will also share their perspectives on these topics and their views on challenges Black women and people of color face and what is being done to help. I feel honored to welcome our incredible panel. First Black female member of parliament and fairness commissioner, Honorable Jean Augustine. First Black female member of provincial parliament and cabinet minister, Honorable Zanena Akande. And first Black female city councillor, Dr. Beverly Salman. You'll be hearing more about these ladies' significant accomplishments, and there are many from our moderator, Gwen Chapman, who many of you know. She is the newly appointed Senior Advisor, Economic Empowerment, Social, Cultural, and Anti-Black Racism Unit for the City of Brampton. She was a for former Special Advisor, Youth Engagement for the City of Toronto, working with Mayor John Tory and a TV producer host. Before I turn things over to Gwen, I just want to remind everyone that this is an interactive event we encourage you to take advantage of the question box below and let us know what's on your mind and if you have any questions for the panelists. I now turn it over to you, Gwen. Thank you so very much, Antoinette, for such a warm welcome. Um, we're so pleased to have this opportunity to bring these three incredible ladies together. Um, I first want to say though, however, um, I wanna thank Mayor Tory and also Mayor Patrick Brown for 
taking up this initiative and developing an anti-Black racism unit in their city. Um, so with that, um, we're just going to get right into a great conversation with uh, these people as we want um, to make sure that we have enough time for, for us to be able to answer your questions and so forth. Now, with everything that's been going on, it's, it's, it's interesting. Life has forced us to look at ourselves, to think a little bit deeper about our purpose. You know, Martin Luther King had a saying. Um, he said, life's most persistent question is what are we doing for others? And I'm so pleased and honored to have these three iconic women in my life. They've been a, a huge part of the community. There's never been a time where they have not said yes to come out to support the initiative that we had, which was to inspire young people. Jean Augustine has a very interesting story. Um, she's not Canadian. And so she had a she's very- She's not Canadian. She's not can Canadian born. <laughs> free, born. She's born on a beautiful island, Grenada, that's in the Caribbean. And she has some fond memories of this one special lady who actually was the catalyst, I guess, the, the, the person who encouraged her to be who she is today. So Jean, tell us about your background and that special lady. Thank you, Gwen. And I'm so very pleased to be with the Empire Club as they start out. And um, Antoinette, as you start out your tenure as president. Um, I am Canadian. I've been here 60 years now, <laughs> six zero. I came here on St. Peter and Paul Day, June the 29th, 1960. And so um, this, looking back over these 60 years, also looking to the place of my birth, Happy Hill, St. George's Grenada, with a grandmother who was a wise um, and as someone would say today, uneducated in that she had no big t titles uh, after her name, but she grew up in the school of hard knocks and, um, and was able to share a lot of experiences with us young people. Coming to Toronto in 1960 and looking at Toronto today, things are so different. And um, 1960, no Charter of Rights and Freedom that didn't come until later. No Human Rights Commission with some of the abilities to come to accept complaints. No SIU, no police talking to community, no school boards interacting with parents, uh, no Landlord and Tenant Act to, um, to help um, people with uh, housing and other issues and on and on and on. And so my struggle when I first came to Toronto was really finding those individuals who were here before me and those individuals who were in the struggle, joining with them and being a real activist for this just society and this society we wanted to build for all of us who were now calling ourselves Canadians. Okay, well, thank you. Zanena. You have also a very interesting story. I remember you telling me lots of, uh, lots of lots of incidences regarding your comparison to Leonard Braithwaite, who was the first black male member of provincial parliament. Uh, I'll, I'll allow you to just go ahead and share that story. <laughs> well, I, uh, unlike Jean, I was born here. I was born in the area to which all immigrants came at that time. And that was Kensington. And uh, it was populated by people who had come from all parts of the world, either uh, to improve their situation or because of the war in their particular countries. And so they came and all around Spadina Avenue and down towards the Queen and King. Um, Bev will remember these areas there. This is where the immigrants and the children of immigrants lived. Uh, it was a great area because we all shared something in common. We were getting out of Kensington <laughs> one way or another. We were going to uh, use the schools uh, and every other opportunity we had to improve our situation. My parents were both educators. My father, uh, they had both taught in, in Barbados. My father was Barbadian and had graduated from Codrington College 
and uh, had some supervisory role in the education system in Barbados. So you can imagine how disappointed they were when they arrived and found that, uh, that they were not allowed to teach. And so I became, we all became the, the students. And uh, Leonard Braithwaite lived not far from us. He too was from Kensington. And uh, being older than me, he, you know, proceeded well through school, did uh, business courses in, in the States and had degrees and became a lawyer. And I got so tired of my parents saying, if he can do it, you can do it. And I thought to myself, if I ever see Leonard, uh, when I'm older, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to tell him about it, which, which I did, and we laughed. But um, it, it was a time when things were beginning to happen. I mean, there was Donald Moore, there was Harry Gary, and they were speaking out, and uh, um, they were improving things. And um, it, it, you know, you got an education just from listening to what they said and listening to my parents critique what they said. And so my, my uh, growth in Toronto is, is, is very much paralleled by the growth of, of, of immigrants. This is, this is where we, we came. We went to Harvard Collegiate and we decided we were going to, to do well so that we could, one way or another, improve our lot. Wonderful. Bev, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story? Right. Well, I was born in Toronto. My father was from Jamaica. He had come to Canada to join the Canadian Army, he was sent to Siberia, but he returned, settled in Toronto, married my mother, who was fourth generation in Canadian, Scottish, Irish. And we um, <clears throat> went to schools in North Toronto, which was uh, not at all diverse. So it was <laughs> diverse. Yeah. And uh, my, we grew up in uh, Toronto where there were signs on the beaches, no dogs, Jews, or colors allowed. Wow. Signs in our department stores, job available, colors and Jews need not apply. The native will remember those those days. And uh, when in school, I was totally humiliated from kindergarten on when the only um, black book that I uh, was exposed to was Little Black Sambo, depicted black people as monkeys swinging from trees. And then in high school, Huckleberry Finn, where the eight N word is used over 200 times. So my schooling was not joyful at all. And I became the first um, person to graduate from Wellesley Hospital School of Nursing. My husband, also born in Toronto, both his parents were Jamaican. And his time at school was very very um, un, un, what would say? unwelcome. Um, <clears throat> he um, was channeled, streamed, in other words, through uh, commercial school because it was uh, assumed that blacks could not achieve, could not go to university. So he had to go back to night school, get his university and admissions and became a, a Canada's first um, black surgeon to get his fellowship in, in general surgery. Mm -hmm. So um, we later moved to Detroit and that was a whole different experience. From the time we crossed the border, we were assumed to be an interracial couple and I was hauled off the bus at the border and almost um, denied entry with him into the US. And from then on, we learned that living in the States, um, we were a novel to our landlord who was from the deep south. You say you people don't even know you're black till you look in the mirror. Because we didn't think that we could not do things. 
we thought we could go to a restaurant without checking to find out we could be served. We thought we could buy a home and then learn that blacks couldn't get mortgage money. So there were many issues that we were immediately um, introduced to and viewed in a, in a very different way. That's amazing. What, what a story. You know, all three of you have been on this planet over eight decades. Right. <laughs> but yet, yes. before this whole pandemic, you all three were everywhere. And I find it just so inspiring and invigorating to see that you haven't said, I'm, ret I'm retired at 60, whatever, 70 years old. You are, you are moving and going on like you're still 35 years old. It's incredible. It's incredible the energy that you have and the passion and the love that you have for the community. And we really feel that. I want you to know also that there are a lot of young ladies, a lot of young girls, a lot of people from the community watching this right now. And it is such a wonderful feeling to be together at this time since we can't actually see and, and be with each other physically. But I'm feeling a sense of warmth, a sense of family. And um, I think as Canadians, isn't this what we're about? We are about trying to bring people together and to create that sense of family. I just wondered with Eugene, how was it, what was it that you found most challenging as a vibrant young woman, mom, wife, and political leader? What were some of the, the challenges that you faced and how did you overcome those challenges? Well, Gwen, I think it's important for me to say that when I first landed in Toronto, I came on what was called a Canada-Caribbean domestic scheme, where I had to work for one year in the home of a Canadian family. Okay. So I learned several things from the very beginning. Um, there were some things coming from an island where the leadership, the people with wealth, things you see around you are Black faces and Black people. Um, and then finding out, as Zanina said, when you landed in this uh, environment, that there were certain places and things that you can't do. And it wasn't just in terms of a Black person. I remember the woman I worked for who was uh, Jewish, that on days when she was going shopping, she put on her gloves, her best dress, her best whatever, <laughs> because she said, you get the service if you dress um, in a certain way that you looked as though uh, you can buy the item that you're looking at. Right. I learned also that, um, that we could make changes that we could make voice or voices heard. And so I got together with all the people who were shakers and movers at the time, who were activists at the time, the Wilson Head, the Al Mercury, the um, Harry Gary, the, all of those people who were, um, who were standing up for this just society that Pierre Elliott Trudeau at the time was talking about and, uh, and what was needed in the society and what we needed to do. And so when we look at the, the lack of role models, uh, either in the media, in magazines, and whatever came to our doors, it was important that you couldn't just sit back and let things happen, that we had to move, that we had to protest, that we had to demonstrate, that we had to go see the, the head of uh, whether it was the Sears or the Simpsons or the Bay to ask about models um, and faces of color in their, uh, in their outputs. So it was, it was something that one had to do. And, um, and I grew up also in an environment where um, the old saying, to whom much is given, much is expected. You can read, so go read for the lady who's, uh, whose son is writing to her and she can't read the letter. I grew up with, um, to, with uh, you have to serve, you have to give back. And so when I came, I was looking for opportunities to give back. And, uh, and I joined organizations and was part of the, uh, the funding of several organizations. The other night I sat down and I wrote there were about 50 to 60 different organizations in the community wow. over these many years that I have been associated with. And, um, and in the old days, Antoinette, the women were not presidents. <laughs> the women were either the secretaries 
or the PROs, the uh, public relations officer for the organization. And so that struggle for women to make their way and to get their way uh, into higher uh, um, avenues for learning, into um, decision-making places, into getting laws that would be just and fair so we can live in that society. It, that, was, um, that was or raise our debt. It wasn't just to make a living. It was also to make the society what we want to see for ourselves and for our children and for the next generation. So when it was always not for me, but for the next generation, not for us who are doing the protesting, but for the next generation. We're going to make it right, not for now, but for the next generation. We're not in the CBC. We're not on the television. We're not, our faces are not in all of these structures, but we're going to make it right for the next generation. Yeah, that's amazing. So, Nina, your level of confidence, that's one thing that we see about you. You have this very no-nonsense kind of posture and attitude about you. And I'm just wondering, is that a part of what has developed as, as, as you have faced racism in a number of, uh, a number of industries? I, please tell us, uh, you know, share with us how you have combated racism and stayed focused on your goals, pursued and accomplished the things that you've always wanted to. Well, you know, um, parents at that time, our parents from the from the islands, especially believed, or many of them believed, if not all of them, that because their children were born here, that their experiences would be different in terms of their acceptance from the experiences that they themselves had had uh, realized. And so they thought, you know, I'll, you'll all be Canadian, and so you won't have this difficulty. Of course, they lived to see that that was not true. And, I, you know, uh, it, it, it's part of uh, what my parents taught me, and it's also a part of, you know, the feeling that I was born here. I live here. This is my country. <laughs> and if anyone isn't going to treat me properly, I'm going to tell them about it. I mean, I'm going to be polite, I'm going to be respectful, but I'm going to be direct because I, you know, so much is hidden by the verbiage that people use that you, 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 you really don't get the message. So when I went to school, if there were problems, I remember, um, I, I, I think I've told this story so many times, in, in that we had a geography book and I still have the copy of that geography book, that <laughs> great, great, great geography book. We all used the same books at that time. And it had this, a little things in it about the Africans. And my father said, this is not true. And you will tell the teacher that this is not true. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm never going to get out of grade five. I'll be here forever. And uh, he said, you tell him. And I said, Dad, they'll, they'll, you know, you don't, you can't say that. And my father said, you will tell. And he told me the day, he said, you go back to school. Well, Monday afternoon, I looked, I don't know why. Someone said to me, that's your dad. Now, I went to a Roman Catholic school. And we were the only black children in it. I was, I was there all by myself because my my uh, brothers and sisters were much older and they had left. And they said, that's your dad, isn't it? And I, I looked outside my father, uh, dressed like he wasn't at work. Because, you know, he worked at Canada Packers. It almost killed him, but that's where he worked. And I stood up and if we got to our social studies class and I wondered, what's my brother doing at that? And I was told that I had to tell Mr. O'Connell that this was not true. And so I did that. Uh, and Mr. O'Connell said, so you write books now? And he was very angry. Let's take uh, the, the moral of the story is that my father was there because he had come into the school so that after school, if I got in trouble, he was going to explain to them uh, why I had said it. Determination comes from, if you 
put a wall in front of someone long enough and often enough and find a confident wall, then after a while, I guess people think it should be there. And it's why I, um, you know, I think my parents created someone that after a while they wish they hadn't <laughs> in terms of being very direct. Because not only would I question the things they told me to question, I would also sometimes question them. And uh, those of us who have West Indian parents know that that's not always well received. Bev, you want to share with us one of your most challenging situations, um, experiences, and, and let us know how you also dealt with that. Well, I found that um, I chose the level of politics that I felt was closest to people, the municipal level, and that uh, you could actually see results immediately from what you're doing. But one of the most challenging things I found was to get a focus on the issues that weren't typically on the agenda, like the anti-racism issues, and to try to get some response to them. Um, because they were out of most of my colleagues' frame of reference. So it wasn't necessarily of that importance to them. And we see today how issues that Zelena and Jean and I have worked on for decades are finally getting some attention worldwide and hopefully we'll move forward. But that's what I found the most challenging, trying to move the agenda forward. Yeah, and so um, how do you feel, Jean, this is to you, how do you feel about the changes that are happening to see a collection of people all over the world supporting and encouraging black folks and, and, and saying basically no more to racism, no more to racism. How does that make you feel as a person who has been fighting for equality and justice and fairness for so, for so long? Sometimes I'm hopeful. And other times I have that sense of deja vu. We were here before. We had these discussions before. We've come to, the, to this point, this peak before. We've had on an international level, we came together in Durban with this huge conference against racism and, uh, you know, and all kinds of discrimination where the world's voices were brought to the table. I've seen, uh, you know, that those uh, incidents happen and they flare up and we think there is going to be the other side when we'll get to the promised land, as it were, the place where equality and diversity and inclusiveness would be uh, would be recognized. And then we slip back because we see people in power and people who are decision makers um, have um, input into the agenda that have create um, the the position where we 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 we're not moving. And I'm hopeful on the other um, on the other side of today's um, today's discussions and today's pro protests and today's um, because I think it's more grassroots than at any governmental or any other levels. As I watch some of the protests, especially the ones in in the UK or in the US, I see the hands that are lifted of all colors, white yes. people who are engaged in this. I see the placards being personal. People made their own, they got their own piece of cardboard and they wrote their own message. So it's not kind of led um, by some bureaucracy or some political uh, party or whatever. It's the people's, it seems to me, it's almost like the people's movement. And when I hear corporate leaders, um, and others saying, I think we were wrong. I think we made a mistake there. I think we recognize that we did not provide um, promotional opportunities, that in the boardrooms of our nations, we don't have uh, the representation of the voices, that some people are waking up to the 400 years of, um, of slavery and, and, uh, and the residue of all of that and the effects of all of that. And it built and recognizes that 
or recognizing that built within their systems are systemic things that deter the full participation and, and individuals, black individuals in the society not reaching their full potential. And so this discussion kind of says to me that maybe we're turning a corner and maybe we'll turn a corner on this. And maybe that discussion coupled with pandemic, with the pandemic, where it shows us now that we're in a small world, that we're all united, that we all are dependent on each other, that uh, what happens in this place happens in the other. When we begin to realize our dependency on each other in the world, it seems to me that the discussion that's happening right now may bring us, hopefully, to a better place than other things I've seen over the years. When I think, and I think so they had also, um, and also Bev would know the demonstrations we've had, the weekly um, badgering, the letter writing, the going to see corporate leaders, all of the things we've done over the years. And uh, we see little change, little change, a little tweak here, a little tweak there. And it's very important that the Empire Club would bring together three of us, three black women to talk about this issue because prior to this, those are not issues that these traditional clubs would be discussion in these traditional clubs. And so it's important, it's important uh, for me to begin to say to myself, maybe this time, maybe this time. And I keep talking about the urgency of now, no. the pandemic, the anti-racist, the um, anti-racist discussion, the systemic racism discussion, the anti-black um, discussion, and all of the other issues that affect uh, indigenous peoples, that affect um, the LGBT and other communities, that all of these things are coming together. So maybe now, we'll begin to see this. Thank you. Zanina, how do you feel? Are you hopeful? Are you hopeful with what you're seeing? And, and what other changes, what more would you like to see happen in our country? Well, I, I, I am hopeful. I'm hopeful because not only do we see a variety of people out there, people from many backgrounds, but you also see young people. And I have a great deal of hope that young people uh, will, will see things differently. After all, you have to stop and think that many of them are groups uh, that uh, are belong to groups that have themselves been discriminated against. You know, uh, for example, the gays, the lesbians, the, the trans, uh, they're a whole other group and they know how it feels. You know, in, in my early days, uh, those people hid they weren't out there. They weren't spoken. You know, people might know, uh, but it was all kept very secret. And uh, it's wonderful to see that that they're they're now accepted, and they you know have those choices. There are uh, the Aboriginals that are out there, and that's wonderful because for so long um, they seemed. Uh, silent. Remember, a few years ago, they had the campaign "Silent No More." So I think that the youth have a, a, another perspective on this. And the other thing is, it's no longer so exceptional to see a black person or an Aboriginal or anybody achieve something that previously was considered exceptional. I mean, I'm still shocked at the fact that in 1990, when I was elected, I was the first black woman to be a cabinet minister anywhere in Canada. When they told me that, I said, I don't believe it, because actually I thought that Rosemary Brown had been a cabinet minister. Now, can you imagine 1990? It took them that long. And so those things are no longer exceptional. There are the, you know, when I started teaching, there were very few te black teachers in the schools. Now you can barely walk into a school where you don't see many of them. So sometimes we fail 
to mark our progress because it's not what we want. It's not the end. But I think that the fact that those people exist in such great numbers now allows people to recognize, hey, why should we hold them back? They have things to offer and they are doing well. And so we better get out of the way. And I'm, I, I'm hopeful, I'm, but I'm also determined. I'm not stepping out of the way until they do open all the doors. That's it. <laughs> well said, Zanina. Well said. Um, Beverly, <laughs> Beverly, so how do you feel um, about everything that's going on? I think it's very important and timely that two pandemics are going on yeah. parallel in a car parallel course. So all eyes are and attention focused on the issues that we've been striving to get some attention for decades. But I am very concerned that this will not be a fast process. Um, systemic racism runs deep in all of our institutions. And it's going to take the collective will of everyone to turn that around. Uh, change is slow, and I hope this isn't a flash in the pan where people feel they're very um, concerned at the moment. Some are getting burned out on the issue. We Black people are getting exhausted <laughs> from the fight, and uh, we need everybody on board, as I say, uh, we've tried for so long just to get simple changes in the curriculum so that Canada's true history is taught, not what we were taught in school. It's still a struggle. Uh, the average Canadian has no idea that uh, of the contribution of Blacks and the length of time they've been in Canada, the 400 years. They don't know about the Chinese building the railroad. They don't know how we interred Japanese people during the Second World War. So a lot of these facts are not even known and people need to educate themselves. But more importantly, we need the uh, education system to focus and change the curriculum. So it's uh, not just left to individuals to, to do this work. But uh, there's changes needed in the financial system. Black businesses are still struggling to get the financial help that they need. And uh, in the judicial system, we can all see what's going on there, the unfairness, and how difficult that is to, to turn around. But we have an opportunity. We're going to have a new police chief. We have an opportunity to look at real, true, systemic change. We can't just t tinker with certain aspects of these systems. They need real, deep, rooted change. But I am encouraged that things will start to finally turn on. I, you know, one of the things I've always thought about is I have this image that Canada is like a family. And in a family, you know, let's say we have four children. We will not be okay as a family that when, when, when two or three out of our four children are doing okay. If we're going to be a strong family, a family that's going to make an, an impact, have an impact, we need to make sure that all our children are doing okay. So in this sense, I really hope that we work towards making sure that all our children from all backgrounds, from all races, experiences do well, and that they have what it takes and they have what, it, what, what they need in order for them to be successful. Zanina, I'm just wondering from, from your point of view, what things do you feel is needed right now in order to really help push to ensure that all communities, all Canadians will have a fair stake to be all that they can be. Well, you know, every time you talk about race issues, 
And uh, you talk about the remediation in large centers, like in school boards. They immediately want to provide workshops. They immediately want to provide uh, situations where they um, interact with their staff or or with uh, in hospitals, the the, the uh, people who work there, and and uh, feeling that if they interact with them and they provide workshops and they provide information that their attitudes will change. It's not a matter of their ignorance. It's a matter of their not wanting to give up their power. <laughs> you know, it's the power that they give up. And I keep saying to people, never mind the workshop. What you need to make it happen quickly, and I know that 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 people say, well, you know, how quickly can you have this happen? What you need is this is what we expect of our employees. And if, in fact, you cannot or will not offer those, if you cannot behave within those realms, you will be fired. And it sounds deliberate and demanding and quick. And so it should be. I mean, you, you know, people come to work in, in Toronto. I don't care at what profession. And surely they must have looked it up. When I go to apply for a job, I read about it. I read where I'm going. I read about the company. I read about the city it's in. And surely they must know that this is what this is the most multicultural, multi-ethnic country or city in the world. So why would you come here with some narrow-minded idea? Why would you be born here with some narrow-minded idea? It's because you have been in a situation where you had power and you are reluctant to give it up. And I think that when too much time addressing their ignorance rather than their paycheck, because it becomes very quick and very definite when you say to people, these are my expectations. And if you don't meet them, then perhaps you will have to employ yourself elsewhere. And I, I sincerely believe that. My, my son always says, you know, that's rather simplistic, mother. I'm not sure it can be done. And I said, it can be done. It has been done in other situations, but I'll save that for another time. <laughs> it has been done. You know, people have been told, this is what I expect. You don't give it to me. <laughs> you can't continue to be here. And that, that's as clear as it can get. Thank you, Zinni. You know, we're going to take a few questions now. So we've got a question from Clara Addo, and she said, she asked, what is the one thing Black female leaders should focus on in order to serve our community? Um, Bev, do you want to take that? Well, I think it's important to, uh, first of all, identify an issue that you're concerned about. But young Black women want to start getting into politics. They need to, to involve themselves in something um, of value. They also need to believe in themselves and uh, they have to recognize they're unique. They don't need to try to be like somebody else. They're a unique individual with value and uh, they need to find their gift and um, to, to use that gift wisely. So I really encourage young Black women especially to um to get involved and it, you can start with it in a very minute way but um, all of us have had a lot of involvement in our past backgrounds with many different issues and organizations so it is most doable okay so we have another question that's from Chantel Hatton um, Jean, I'm going to forward, I'm going to direct that one to you. Um, she said, we need to speak to our government and corporate, corporate leaders about these issues. What specific actions should we be asking them to take? Where would you suggest that we start this conversation? 
This conversation has to start right at home. Too many of our young people, and I've had um, occasions to ask, who is your school trustee? Who is the mayor of your city? Who represents you in the provincial parliament? Who represents you at the federal level? So first of all, you need to know who the folks are who are representing you, and the conversation starts at home with them. And then you move this into ensuring that there are other, others in your circle who care about the particular issue. And then you start moving on that particular issue, doing some research, some background, because oftentimes we move ahead without knowing that something like this has previously happened, that this has been a discussion that has taken place at whatever level. So doing your research, doing the background, getting some people with you, moving along with the representative, um, whether it's a provincial question or a municipal question, moving along with the person who represents the individual who is a representative of that area, having them understand what the issues are, and then mobilizing. I think the whole issue is mobilizing as you move forward, because to go right from what you th what you're thinking of straight into legis into getting some legislation, it just won't happen like that. It's a mobilizing. It's a getting of the issue known. It's a writing uh, media or op eds or finding some way to get the message out. And I know the young people are very much now into social media, and. Um, starting to, uh, th this is what we did in, in, in those days. You know, the, um, the back to school pamphlets would come to the home back, send your child back to school and all these beautiful little uh, blonde, uh, blue eyed children um, with no physical disability, nicely dressed and the price and the cost of the dress thrown to the door. So what did myself and others, we said, we don't see any of our black kids on yet. And so we went from door to door and we picked up all of those flyers. We rolled it together and we went to the Bay or, and, or to wherever it came from and say, look, don't put this thing around until you have some of our children. Let's give them an opportunity to model, get them an opportunity so that when our kids look through this, they could see somebody who looked like themselves. So it's a business of mobilizing, finding others, who have the same uh, sentiments as you have, finding your local person and beginning to move it up so that you get to the legislative process. Thank you, thank you, Jean. Zanina, this question is to you. Um, this comes from J.D. Baxt. How do we help organizations support the growth of black employees without promoting tokenism? I believe they have organizations, I'm sorry, would you repeat it? Um, he said, how do we help organizations support the growth of Black employees without promoting tokenism? Well, I, I think uh, speaking to them and the employees and understanding, I know um, when I went to the, um, to the provincial government, uh, many of the Black civil servants came to me and spoke very uh, uh, bluntly about the fact that they had been there so many years and had been held back and that their um, applications for a promotion were, were rejected at listening to their concern, asking them, what have you done uh, in order to promote yourself? Have you taken the courses uh, that, um, that are required for you to move forward? And some of them would say, for example, that they were that their applications for those courses and the funding for that, even the funding for it, would be refused by their superiors. And so, um, with that information, then you move forward, and you you have to do it in a way that uh, that doesn't put the 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 employees themselves under the bus. You have to say, how is it or who is it that you would want me to speak to? And you also know who the appropriate people are so that you're taking them with you. You're not going uh, to do something which is going to be putting them 
in a negative position because that's the kind of thing that you have to worry about when you're speaking for a group. When I speak for you, I have to have your support and your permission to say what I'm going to say so that I don't put you in a negative position. Um, and then you have to decide that you're not going to go once and forget about it. These are long-term things. People have been holding on to power for a very long time. And so they question your right to challenge them on this issue. Uh, and uh, the other thing I'm going to say is the last thing is that you have to be certain that the people who are asking for your help are prepared and knowledgeable about what they really want. Because sometimes you find that uh, they haven't done all of their homework, some of them. But usually nowadays, you know, I find people are quite astute. They don't come and ask for help unless they, they've prepared the way. Yeah. Thank you, Zanina. Um, so this question is from Sarah. I'm going to direct that to you, Bev. Do you find that Black Canadian women are as engaged in elections as their American sisters? And if not, how can that be changed? Well, we have had organizations that are promoting women in, in politics. Um, we find that people really need to be encouraged to put their themselves forward. We need the support of others as well. But uh, I don't know that um, Canadian women are any less engaged than our American sisters. Um, I, I just haven't seen that myself. Okay. Zanina, this one is to you. Uh, this is from Catherine Jissy. Oh, she says, a question for you. How do you make organizations accountable to have more Black leaders at the executive level? Well, of course, you, first of all, you have to introduce the topic. You have to say why. Have you ever had um, a, a representative from the Black community? Or have you ever had uh, a, 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 someone leading this group other than uh, Caucasian male? I mean, <laughs> those were our, that, those were our situations uh, uh, years ago. Have you? It, how many? Um, how many people does this organization represent? And, and according to its goals, this is the thing. Don't you think those goals would be better achieved if you had people who were profiting from this organization also being in its leadership? You ask what I used to call, you'll forgive me, dumb questions to allow people to see how ridiculous the omission is. And I would rather ask them and bring them to that realization than tell them. Uh, because uh, sometimes they, the answers they give you are such that they themselves are embarrassed by them. Well, we've never had another leader. Why not? Well, they don't seem to come forward. Are they in the executive? No. Well, you know, what difference does it make? Now, then, I love when they ask me what difference it makes because then I one of the things, Gwen. Yeah. One of the things, and you know, I think that what that we have begun in our community is looking at the uh, the women and looking at the strengths, looking at the academic achievements, looking at the professional achievements of these women. And so we have this program, 100 Accomplished Black Canadian Women. We have a database of 100 uh, in 2016, 100 2018, 100 um, 2020. So we have a database of these hundreds of women with their accomplishments, with their professional background, with their work experience. And uh, we have that database available to Corporate Canada, to boardrooms, to, um, to institutions, and to other places. One just have to pick up that document and find these accomplished women. 
Gene, do the companies ask for that database? Because remember, uh, there have been other groups that collected mm -hmm. that data and then said that the difficulty they had was getting it out, was getting companies to use it or was getting organizations to use it. Well, this is why I'm referring to it here, so that all those who are listening uh -huh. could, could know that we have this 100 accomplished Black Canadian women. And uh, we we do galas where we put the books out and we, we send it into all kinds of corporate places. But again, it's leadership is so crucial and important when we talk about uh, the boardrooms of our nation, or we talked about the hierarchy in our institutions. Uh, leadership is so important. There has to be that willingness to look around the boardroom and say, this is not right. We cannot all be uh, 15 men around here. We cannot all be so many, um, you know, of, of one ethnic or one racial or whatever group that uh, the questions become, the, the answers to the questions are different when you have a, a, a composition, when you have what we call the multicultural nature of Canadian society around the table, that you have the voices, young and old, you have um, the experience, uh, the years of experience together with uh, the, the racial and, uh, and other minority groups you have before you a board or you have before you leadership that can make a difference. And so what we're doing we right now is making sure that we put these women forward and we put their bios forward so that, you know, again, when we go back, you can't legislate love, but you could legislate that people do the right things. And we know in some of the, um, in, in some other uh, areas, in the Scandinavian, other experiences, They've shown where they say to boards, you have to have this percentage of women. You have to have this number of women to this number of men on your boards. And it, 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 it happened. So I think we have to be at the point where boards and corporate leaders have to begin an institutional uh, leadership has to be such that they have to recognize that their boards or their institution or their leadership team or whatever is not the composition of the face of all major urban areas. Thanks, but thank I you. That's the point, uh, Jean. I think that those of us who sit there have to en uh, initiate the conversation. Otherwise, very often, it does not happen. Not mm -hmm. all the time. But very often, the conversation happens when those of us who sit there say, just a minute, may I ask, this isn't good enough. Because being able to sit at that meeting not only gives us an opportunity, but it makes it almost our, 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 our reason to be there to make sure that others will be sitting That's there. Right. That's right. Yeah, identifying the women really does work because mm -hmm. uh, in the early 70s, Chatelaine Magazine did an article on 103 women likely to succeed in politics. Uh, I was named as one of them and so were many others uh, who have gone on to, uh, to um, be active in politics. So what Jean's doing with the 100 accomplished women is a really important initiative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pose the last question for you, and that is, um, what would you want to share with the young people out there? Um, what is the most important um, lesson that you'd like to give to them? I would say you can be and do anything you want. Get prepared for it. Learn about it decide upon it, not relative to somebody else, not as we used to say, unless or until, and that was unless we got married or until we got married. <laughs> rather, <laughs> rather, whether you're married or not, uh, whatever your other plans are, decide on what you want to do and go for it. Mm -hmm. Beth, I, I would, yeah. Beth, 
make sure you know the area. Make sure too many of them halt looking for other. Pardon. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Bev, Bev, uh, hold, hold fast your dreams and believe in yourself and accept the love and support around you and support others. Thank you. And Jean? I would say know yourself, know your passion, and also know that nothing comes easily. That most people who have made it to whatever and made it to wherever have fallen many times and had to get up and had to keep on going. And I think that uh, that don't expect that life will just part waves for you. You have to work hard, you have to know your passion, and you have to work hard towards the fulfillment of whatever your vision, your dream, or your goal is. Thank you. And you know what? Since we started off with talking about purpose, I, I would like to find, um, ask you if you could make something very short, say something very short in terms of your life purpose, what would you want us to say about you? <laughs> I would like to, I would like to see I would like to see on my tombstone <laughs> she was <laughs> she worked hard, <laughs> she served the community, and she loved everyone. <laughs> Zanina? Oh. oh my God. <laughs> um, she did the best she could. She told the truth sometimes when uh, people didn't want to hear it. And, uh, and she was interested in the community. Beverly? She was determined. She was a Capricorn. And she <laughs> had a fulfilling life that she loved. Thank you so much, all three of you, for this incredible, <laughs> inspirational moment. Um, I hope our young people can feel your resilience, your courage, your compassion, and the strength and the love that you have for all Canadians, all people all over the world, and that they will embrace their talents and do something wonderful with the gifts that God has given them. Thank you so much, Antoinette and the team for doing this. <laughs> Thank you, Gwen. I almost want to ask you that last question, but I won't do that to you. <laughs> when you're the moderator, because that's a terrific question to end this uh, little discussion. Um, I would now like to introduce Monique Rudder. Uh, she's the partner, tax and legal practice lead at Deloitte Canada to deliver the appreciation remarks. Thank you so much, Antoinette, and congratulations on your new role as president. Uh, it's really, truly been a privilege to be here today with you, our esteemed panel, and the webcast participants. On behalf of the Empire Club of Canada, um, our audience, and of course, Deloitte, I want to express such a sincere thank you to our panel, uh, the Honorable Dr. Jean Augustine, the Honorable Zanina Akande, and Dr. Beverly Salmon, and of course, our wonderful moderator, Gwen Chapman, uh, your comments today were so relevant just at a time when we are collectively considering how we can move into the future to create a more equitable society for black women and other minority groups in our communities. You know, I was particularly moved to hear about your challenges that you faced in your lives and your careers, and especially those early years when you faced overt racism, yet you focused on the opportunities, you know, particularly the ones around education, giving back to your community, and, and just really refusing to buy into the idea that there were things that you just couldn't do. Um, and more importantly, I am motivated by your insights on steps that we can take to build on the past and really ignite the future around diversity and inclusiveness, um, specifically your ideas around continuing to be active in our communities, uh, to influence the changes we want to see for ourselves and for those coming up behind us, but first ensuring that we're really educated on the work that has been done so we can focus our efforts, um, including businesses and public sector allies to identify and um, address those systemic issues that have perpetuated the inequalities that we know exists. And then, of course, that powerful um, example of utilizing the education system mm -hmm. to reflect the contributions of Blacks and other minority groups and that, that the contributions we've made around the vibra vibrancy of this great country that we live in. It truly um, gives us hope that uh, we have a bright future, but that we all do need to lean in if we want to see those opportunities materialize. Uh, so thank you again, sincerely, for this powerful discussion. Uh, thank you as well to our audience for your active engagement. It's been such a pleasure to spend this time with you.
And I'll turn it back to you now, Antoinette. Thank you, Monique. Well, I don't think I could add anything more. You, you said it all. I said it at the beginning. Wow, you ladies. Um, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being on my first event. <laughs> this is so fabulous. And Jean, thank you for noting this, that this panel, I can't believe the Empire Cup never did this before. We have to do more of this stuff. So you ladies were amazing. Thank you all. Thank you, Gwen, for doing a terrific job. And I hope you can all join us for our next event, which will be also very interesting. Um, it's all about the impact of COVID-19 um, on Canadian women from a mental health, money, and the social shifts we're seeing. So that's on July 29th at noon. So please join us for that. And um, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.